As was previously announced, today we begin a new and exciting series from the Word of God. It's titled, We Wish to See Jesus. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of John, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Over the years, we have concentrated our studies of the Word of God primarily on the New Testament epistles since they were written not only for us, but to us as born-again members of the church, the body of Christ. But over the last few years, we've certainly broadened our understanding of the Old Testament. to our own edification and delight. Yet I believe we're still lacking a good grasp on the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ as set forth in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where we see our Savior up close and personal. And to help bridge that gap, as well as to get to know our Lord and Savior more intimately, we're going to devote the next three months or so to the theme we wish to see Jesus. Now, you're probably wondering, where did you get that title? Well, I got that title right from John chapter 12. We begin reading in verse 9. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna! This is what we know as Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore sit among themselves. You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Like, what a terrible thing that would be. Now, there were certain Greeks also among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. And by the way, I am convinced that there are believers today who want to get to know Jesus Christ more and more. As well as there are unbelievers today who, by virtue of the sense of conscience in, in, inside them, that gives them an innate knowledge that God exists. Creation outside of them, that bears witness to that innate knowledge. The, through the convicting ministry of the Spirit of God and through the preaching of the gospel, while no man naturally seeks after God, God is drawing them, and they're saying, in essence, we wish to see Jesus. And you know what Jesus Christ says to those without Christ, without hope? without God and without salvation, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not come after me, that's later. Come to me. Come by faith. You're laboring under the law. You're heavy laden with a sense of guilt. You're looking for forgiveness. You're looking for 
purpose you're looking for salvation. Come to Christ. Believe he died for your sins and rose again. Trust in him alone and be saved. And you will find rest for your soul regarding eternity. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come learn from me and come learn about me. And learn to trust me. And let me give rest for your soul, that peace of God that passes all understanding. For you see, the value of faith lies in your object of faith. And the more you know someone who unconditionally loves you and is faithful and gracious, the more you should be willing to trust him. And that is why as we turn now to Luke chapter 24, we see some believers that are downtrodden. Some believers that are disappointed. Some believers that are confused in light of what had transpired just days earlier in Jerusalem. For these disciples had placed their faith in the Lord Jesus. They had believed that he was going to bring in the kingdom. They had trusted him for their salvation. They had trusted him to bring in the kingdom. And instead... That did not happen. So we read in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, these words. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together in all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And their eyes were restrained. So they did not know him. They didn't recognize him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And you have not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, provide national salvation. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You see, what he's saying there, dear friends, is don't you know your Bible? Don't you believe what God said about his son? Don't you know it was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? Isn't that what Psalm 22, isn't that what Isaiah 53, isn't that what Daniel 9, isn't that what Zechariah 12 says? And that he should enter into his glory as well? Doesn't the Old Testament teach that? Don't you believe his word? And by the way, the resurrection of Christ was predicted in the Old Testament too. So what does God do to lift their spirits? as they were saddened due to unbelief. And by the way, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. Notice, their problem was slow to believe. And so often, that's our problem. Our problem is a spiritual problem. We're not believing God. We're not trusting Him. We're not believing his promises. So what does he do? Here's the solution. In beginning at Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, and in all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
He said, let me show you about me in the Old Testament. And as he does, their hearts were lifted. Their hearts burned. They glowed with joy as they saw a fresh look of Jesus Christ. And their faith was encouraged. For you see, on the pages of the Old Testament, let alone the New, who do we find? The person, finished work, and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not to suggest, as some tell us today, that you have not found the true meaning of the text until you have found Jesus Christ in it. And that every verse, there's a picture or something of Jesus Christ. If you come to that conclusion, you will force interpretation on the passage. You will eisegete instead of exegete. And as a result, you will use your imagination to find Christ where he is not found. On the other hand, the Word of God was not designed to scintillate our intellect or satisfy our curiosity, but to transform our lives into making us like Jesus Christ as we behold with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. You see, God wants us to behold in the mirror of his word the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. To gaze upon him. To gaze upon his unconditional love so that he transforms us by his spirit into an agape love kind of person. To transform us about his holiness. To transform us in light of his forgiveness. To transform us in light of his faithfulness. And notice, while beholding is active, being transformed is passive. It's something God does in our life. Notice, we're not, it's not by imitation, it's by transformation that we become more like Jesus Christ. That's why Paul would say to the Galatians, of whom I travail in birth again, till Christ be formed in you. And notice that he's forming us into the same image. What image? The real image of Jesus Christ. Not one of our own making. As many people have an idea about Jesus Christ that does not line up with the pages of Scripture. And he wants to transform your thinking so that you have the mind of Christ. He wants to transform your speech so you speak the truth in love. He wants to transform your actions so that you're doing the will of God. He wants to transform your motives for the glory of God and not the praise of men. And he does it from glory to glory, from stage to stage, from one place of maturity to the next. Justice from the Lord the Spirit. Not by trying hard, but by trusting the Spirit of God to use the Word of God as we walk in fellowship with the Son of God and we get to know Him more and more and more. That's what God wants in your life. Is that what you want? Is that not what you need in your marriage? Is that not what you need in your family? Is that what you need in your single life? That's exactly what God wants to do. And that's why in this series on We Wish to See Jesus, we will see him, pictures of him, verses of him, types of him, from Genesis through Revelation. We'll see him today in the Old Testament prophecies. We'll see him Wednesday night as we see him in the book of Isaiah in an incredible way. We'll see him next Sunday by way of types. We'll see him in his earthly ministry, in his baptism, his temptation, his offer of the kingdom to Israel, his turning the water into wine. We're going to see him talking to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again, and talking to the Samaritan woman and says, I have some water I want to give you, and you will never quench again for what I have to give you. We're going to see him in his holiness preaching on hell. We're going to see him raising Lazarus from the dead. We're going to see his love for sinners. We're going to see him teaching in his parables. We're going to see him in the Olivet Discourse saying, Israel, I will see you later, but I'm coming again, and I will keep my promises. And then we'll see him in the Upper Room Discourse, and I want you to know, church, it's right around the corner, and this is what you have to look forward to once I leave in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see him 
in his illegal trials. We're going to see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to see him dying on the cross for our sins. We're going to see him buried and preaching to the spirits in prison. We're going to see him raised from the dead, making his appearance. And then we're going to see him ascending into heaven. And before he does, we're going to hear him say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not going to be an exhaustive study. But it's going to be an enjoyable one, an edifying one, a needed one, in which we trust that you're going to get to know your Savior better. And that by his grace, you're going to become more like him in light of it. So today we begin by looking at, we wish to see Jesus in Old Testament prophecy. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. As you do, it's incredible to know that in the Old Testament, there are at least 333 predictions regarding Jesus Christ with 109 prophecies fulfilled in Christ's first coming. In fact, there were 30 prophecies fulfilled in one day when Jesus Christ died. The mathematical odds of one man fulfilling this are astronomical. And unless God the Father made the predictions and the Son of God fulfills each of them, it would never happen. And dear friends, you should be impressed today with Jesus Christ as he is the only person in human history that has had numerous and explicit details given beforehand of his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrections, written in documents, given to the public, and widely circulated centuries before he ever had appeared. And that's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, what does only begotten mean? His unique son. The Greek word is monogonis, his one-of-a-kind son. There was never one like him. For the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And keep in mind that the purpose of God in his plan of the ages is to glorify his sovereignty and grace, both in creation and redemption, ultimately expressed in the establishment of his kingdom in the heavens and the earth through Jesus Christ. He is the main actor. He is the main focus. The second member of the Trinity. And today we will see seven select prophecies about our Lord. The first one's found in Genesis chapter 3. And in doing so, we will see the first promise of his coming. If you were with us in our study of the book of Genesis, we, you recognize that man was created in the image of God in order to have fellowship with God. But man chose to disobey God here in Genesis chapter 3. And as a result, there's a divine judgment placed Upon the serpent, placed upon Satan, placed upon the woman, placed upon the man, placed upon the ground. In the midst of the scene of judgment, we pick it up in verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his There's going to be hostility from that point on between you and the woman. You is Satan and the woman is Eve and her seed, her descendant. You see, her descendant ultimately will be the Lord Jesus Christ, but also the seed of the woman certainly encompasses believers throughout the ages, as this is a prediction of a long war against God between Satan and God, and ultimately, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, her seed. And by the way, women do not have seed. Men have seed, as it were, in Scripture. But this hints at the virgin conception and birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, he shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Now, to get bit on the heel or to 
have your heel bruised is painful but not life-threatening. But if you crush the head of a snake, it's dead. And you see, this is a prediction of the fact that the Messiah one day is coming and he's going to provide salvation, not only for individuals but for the entire world. And he's going to crush the head of Satan in time by way of the cross and ultimately by way of being cast into the lake of fire at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. For you see, as we think of the purposes of God in human history, they all center around creation and redemption. And in doing so, we recognize that God has a plan for the universe. God has a plan of salvation for individual men. God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for the church. He has a plan for the angels. He even has a plan for the demons, ultimately. And you see, this plan, again, ultimately is centered to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. And this is a promise of the future salvation of mankind and ultimately the planet as well, to the glory of God. Now, as we think of this, this leads us now to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. For here we see the prophesied birth line of Jesus coming. You see, his birth line was predicted hundreds, yea, thousands of years before he came. In fact, at least 4,000 years, starting with the seed of the woman prophecy, but also his prophesied birth line would be from Abraham. Prior to Abraham, there were only Gentiles living on the world. Abraham, though a Gentile, would be the father of the Jewish nation. And it would be through him the Messiah would come. We read in Genesis 12 and verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, back in chapter 11, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make a great nation, make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham, because through Abraham, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer would come. Now, if you know the story about Abraham, he had been promised a child. But instead of waiting on God to fulfill that, we have Operation Hagar, in which he consummates with his bondservant, as it were, and a child comes out, namely Ishmael. And while God does promise to bless Ishmael, we recognize that he's not the seed. He's not the promised descendant. That's not how the Messiah would come. For in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12, God makes it very clear that it's going to be through Isaac that he comes. In Genesis 21 verse 12, But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, not Ishmael, your seed shall be called. So this promised line of the Messiah would come from Abraham. And secondly, from Isaac, not from Ishmael. Thirdly, from Jacob, not from Esau, his twin brother. And you know, Jacob was a chiseler. And this reminds you that this lineage is one of grace. But then again, working with humans, it had have to be one of grace. And that's why in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, we read, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Watch this. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Judah. See, this is a promise that a star, a scepter, who carries a scepter is a king. This is a promise. It's going to come out of Jacob, the Messiah. From Abraham, from Isaac, from Jacob, and fourthly, from Jesse. 
as we go down the road even further. And who is Jesse? He's the father of David. And in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, we read, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and so forth. Is that hard to read? Hopefully it's not. But notice, a rod from the stem of Jesse. This is a promise of the coming Messiah and the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit of God in his life. And notice, he's a rod from the stem of Jesse. Now, Jesse had several children, as you know. And it would be from the youngest. And who's the youngest child of Jesse? From David. From David. And David predicted by the Holy Spirit regarding his son Solomon. The Lord said, He shall build a house for my name. And Solomon did. It was called the temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. 2 Samuel 7, 13 and 16. You see, the coming king and the Messiah would come again through a predicted birth line, the seed of the woman. In Genesis 9, the seed of Shem. In Genesis 12, the seed of Abraham. In Genesis 21, the seed of Isaac. In Genesis 28, the seed of Jacob. Genesis 49, the seed of Judah. Isaiah 11, the seed of Jesse. 2 Samuel 7, the seed of David. And then through him, via Solomon. So as we now turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. What are the very first things we read in the New Testament? If you were a Jew living in Jesus' day, you would ask, question, was Jesus the Messiah? Question two, if so, why didn't Israel accept him? Question number three, since they didn't, would God still fulfill his promises? And Matthew comes along and says, yes, he was the Messiah. They rejected him because he didn't fit their preconceived idea, and they would not come to him by faith. And thirdly, God always keeps his promises. They're just going to be delayed. So we read in Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What would a Jew want to know? What is your birth line? What is your genealogy? Does it fulfill the Old Testament scriptures we believe? Are you a descendant of David? Are you a descendant of Abraham? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. Jesus Christ is. And that is why the genealogy then from verses 2 through 17 mention in detail the birth line, the family tree of Jesus Christ, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. In verse 16 we read, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so we see that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies uh, regarding the Messiah. He, he, Jesus is the rightful Messiah. And again, the chances of that happening are literally astronomical. And you see that phrase in verse 16, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ? Who is whom in reference to? Mary. But every other mention in the genealogy by way of, of whom or begot is a man. Yes, there are four women mentioned in the genealogy, but not of whom. This again is hinting at least at the particular prophesied method of Christ's birth. 
that it was going to be a unique birth. It was going to come through a virgin conception. Predicted back in Matthew, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Now that doesn't happen every day. And bear a son, gender stated. And shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So what do we read in verse 18 of Matthew 1? Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Not from Joseph. Then Joseph, her husband, as he had been engaged, betrothed, therefore viewed as a husband, though not legally consummating the marriage yet, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly because he thought she was unfaithful. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, right birth line, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, just like Isaiah 7, 14 said. And you shall call his name Jesus, Jehovah saves. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, again, Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child. And bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You see, when you saw Jesus Christ, who did you see? God with us. Verse 24, then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her sexually, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. You see, what God predicts, God fulfills, including the conception of a child in the womb of a virgin. And you know, it's incredible that both Mary and Joseph took God at his word, accepted the will of God for their life, even though they would be ridiculed as adulterous and adulterer. That he would be a child of fornication, John 8 said. So they slandered him. And yet that's exactly what God had predicted. Not only the first promise of his coming, not only the prophesied birth line of his coming, not only the prophesied unique method of Christ's birth through a virgin, but fourthly, the prophesied birthplace of Jesus' coming. Remember, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth, but that would not be the birthplace of our Lord. For Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, it said... But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Notice he's going to be born in Bethlehem, though he's from everlasting. Why? Because he is God. And you see, Bethlehem is right here, not too far from Jerusalem. It would be there, but it would not be in Nazareth where they lived. So what do we read in chapter 2 and verse 1? Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east, from the area of Iraq today, Babylon, came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, quote, Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them 
what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Liar. He wanted to destroy him. And yet God protected him and revealed to them in a dream they were to go to Egypt for the next couple of years or so before they would come back and before or after Herod was dead. You see, dear friends, the prophesied birthplace was in Micah 5 2. The fulfillment was in Matthew 5 or Matthew 2 because God always keeps his word always. Fifthly, we see in the Old Testament the prophesied time of Christ's birth and the prophesied time of his death even. You see, Christ's birth and death was not an accident but a divine appointment in the plan of God. In Daniel chapter 9, we read a passage in which God is communicating to the prophet Daniel, and he tells him 70 weeks, 70 cycles of seven years, in other words, 490 years are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, namely Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most High. In other words, to ultimately bring in the kingdom that's been planned. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, keep that in mind, until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 years. In other words, 483 years. The street shall be built again in the wall, and indeed that happened under Nehemiah even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off and not for himself. You see, the phrase cut off is a term, as it were, for death, that the Messiah would die, but not for himself. For when he died, he died for you, and he died for me. And you see, if you were to trace this 70-week prediction of Daniel, we know exactly the date in which the decree to restore was March 5th, 444 B.C. Artaxerxes' decree according to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. We also recognize, as we think of 69 weeks, this is 483 years. So when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass, would have been March 30th, A.D. 33, what's called the triumphal entry. And if you know your Bible, in less than one week, Jesus would be cut off. The city and temple would then be destroyed. We know that we're in the church age, but there are seven years yet that are yet to be fulfilled. And they will be filled, fulfilled after the church is raptured and when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty to defend Israel, and then begins what we call the tribulation period, the last half called the Great Tribulation, where the man of sin declares himself to be God like we saw in our scripture reading today. And that is why Zechariah 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. And he's lowly and he's riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that's exactly what's recorded in Matthew 21. For you see, as we think of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. Born of a woman, Mary. Born under the law, that was the dispensation. And why did he come to redeem those who are under the law? That we might receive the adoption of sons. At the exact time in God's plan, 
He came. And by the way, if they had known their Bibles and had they attracted appropriately, they would have known the exact day when he came into Jerusalem. This is our Messiah. And remember, some of them chanted, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But within a week, there would be those in the crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. As he would be cut off, just like God said. And as a result, we see these prophecies being fulfilled about our Lord. Including his unique person. There's never a person who has walked the face of the earth like Jesus Christ. You see, on the one hand, he would be fully deity. He is God. And in the unity of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But he is deity. And you know, what is the verse we say at Christmas? Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who is Jesus Christ? He is Mighty God. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. And by the way, the two books of the New Testament that quote the Old Testament the most or the book of Matthew and the book of Hebrews in light of their audiences. You see, in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, we read, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And everyone would say, Amen! Your throne, O oh God, is forever. He is the sovereign God and King of the universe. He rules with righteousness the scepter of your kingdom. But if you look with me at Hebrews chapter 1, we have a little addition, a little qualification, a little explanation given before that verse is quoted. What does it say in verse 8? But to the Son, he says... Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Notice, to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. You see, when you're looking at Jesus Christ, when you're seeing Jesus, you're seeing God in human flesh. And that's why the most quoted verse in the New Testament from the Old Testament is Psalm 110, verse 1. A psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Question, does the Lord have a Lord? Who is the Lord and who is David's Lord? Well, David's Lord is God. The Lord said to my Lord, you see, even in the Old Testament, the truth of the Trinity is found, whether it be, let us make man in our image, or, or hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord Yahweh, our Elohim, is one Yahweh. Or even here, there's two lords mentioned in the same verse. And you see, when you think about Jesus Christ, if you want to know him according to the Bible, you recognize that he is God. For you see, only God can save you. And if he's anything less than God, you have a Savior who cannot save. And that is why Jesus could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But he's not only full of deity, but secondly, he was full humanity. He was fully man. He would be the seed of the woman. The lineage of Jesus was all a human lineage. And that's why I don't think that Jesus was 50% human, 50% God. Oh no. He was 100% human and 100% God. And you see those two branches of messianic data is found in, 
in the Old Testament. It's called theologically the hypostatic union in which Jesus Christ is 100% deity, 100% humanity, the only begotten son, the unique one of, one of a kind son who would be fully deity, fully humanity, and thirdly, without sin. He would be without sin. But then again, would we not expect that God in human flesh would be without sin? And yet, pictured in the Old Testament, where when it comes to the Passover lamb, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. A male and unblemished. And that is why when John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus coming, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If he had sin in him or uh, in him, he could not have been the Savior. And that is why Peter reminds us, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, now watch this, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. A blemish or spot would be a picture of sin. And that is why the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, For we do not have a high priest who cannot, be, cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like as we are, yet without sin. You see, he needed to be that. For if he was going to be the one mediator between God and man, he would have to be fully God, and he'd have to be fully man to be the mediator. And being fully man, he was able to give himself a ransom payment for us. And that's why the seventh wonderful prophecy we see from the Old Testament was regarding the manner of Jesus Christ's death. Go with me to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now, if you know anything about the Jews in Jesus' day, they would normally stone criminals to death. But remember, while the Jews plotted his death, and while indeed the religious leaders of that day were held accountable for that death, the Jesus was not stoned to death. He was crucified, as this was employed by the Romans. But this was predicted in the Old Testament. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever heard that before? It's what Jesus said on the cross. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, you do not, and you, and, and am not silent. Why did he forsake him? Because you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. You see, God is holy, and Christ was becoming sin for us. So therefore, the penalty for sin is death spiritually, resulting in physical death and ultimately eternal death. And it was Christ dying for you and me that caused him to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fulfillment of Psalm 22. If you look with me now, at verse 16, we read, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, as he was emaciated there on the cross. They look and stare at me, then as he sees the Roman soldiers around him, they divide my garments among them and my clothing for my clothing they cast lots. By the way, this was written a thousand years before Jesus Christ came. And clearly, David did not fulfill this, but the descendant of David did. They pierced my hands and my feet, speak of crucifixion. And that's why Zechariah would say, they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for me. 
incredible. What have we seen thus far? The Messiah, the seed of the woman, was to come at a specific time. Be born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem through a specific birth line. And he would be the unique God-man who would die by crucifixion. Are you impressed? You should be. There's never been anything like this in the history of mankind. There's only one way to explain this. God. Now you might be thinking, I understand, but so what? So what? What does this mean to me? And let me leave you with some things in which it should mean to you. First of all, number one, you are wise to trust your Bible. God's word is always true, always. You're wise to trust your Bible. Do you know of any book that makes those kind of predictions? Do you know of any book like that that stands behind its integrity and will make those predictions and show that they were fulfilled? Nothing like it in any of the religions and any of the holy books of the world. Don't let some college or high school or otherwise teacher or influence undermine your confidence in the word of God. Don't try to be PC, be BC, biblically correct. And parents and grandparents, think about your children and grandchildren and the next generations and the importance of them embracing the Bible as the word of God. For God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Secondly, you please God when you trust in him and his promises. God is always faithful, always. By the way, did he keep his promises? Yes. At least 109 of them in Christ's first coming. You say, what about the other 224 in his second coming? And in the meantime, he's made promises to you. God is always faithful. You know what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? There is no testing taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not test you above what you are able, but with the test, provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He knows what you're going through. His promises are there for you. In fact, it's of his mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. By the way, God doesn't owe you another day. In fact, if he gave us what we deserve, he'd give us hell. He is so gracious to us. He is so faithful. In fact, as believers, when we are out of fellowship with him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, oh, you don't know what I'm going through. You know, others have disappointed me. Others have forsaken me. I feel so alone. I want you to know that Hebrews 13, 5, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, you can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. You say, I'm really afraid, pastor, of certain things. And you know what God's promise says? Fear you not, for I am with you, God says. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will hold you with my righteous right hand. The question is, will we trust him for this? Will we deem him as a reliable object of our faith? And that's why, number three, you need to remember that God's plan is centered in Jesus Christ, not you. We've sought to lift up Jesus Christ today. Are you impressed? Are you impressed with him, your Savior? Are you impressed with him, your Lord, whom you are to yield to? Are you impressed with him, your life, whom you are to abide in? Are you impressed with him, your friend, who's there for you through thick and thin? Because, you know, others will forsake you at times. Others will die. But he will be there for you. And God's plan centers around him. You see, when all the arrows are pointing this way, me, myself, and I, you are a miserable wretch. 
and you're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And you're going down one dead end street after another thinking, only now I'll be happy. You will not. You may have some temporary happiness, but you will not have inner joy. For apart from a right vertical relationship with God, man is miserable and life is meaningless. But you know what's so incredible about this plan? While it centers in Christ, it includes you. And he has a plan for you. And you are alive like Esther 4.14 for just a time like this. Don't waste it. Capture it. You say, oh, pastor, but I have failed. Yes, you may have failed, but God still has you alive and breathing, and he's willing to pick it up right where you're at and carry you right where he wants you to be. You say, well, pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ yet personally as my Savior. Well, if that's true... You can be saved forever by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. God's plan is one of amazing grace, always. You see, grace means God wants to bless us when he, we deserve to be punished. He wants to show us unconditional kindness. And that's why Christ died on the cross, and when he died, he said, it is finished. So the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You say, but pastor, i am already been saved. And yes, that takes only a moment of time. It's an act of faith that results in salvation, but it's an attitude of faith. Day by day, in the Lord and in his word, it's how we grow and how we get transformed. And you see, your faith, your hope, and your love will grow as you get to know more intimately and are impressed with the person of Jesus Christ via the word of God. And that's what we want to do in this series. We want you to come along for the ride. We're going to teach on Sundays and on Wednesdays. And if you can't make it on Wednesday nights, and I know some of you have difficulty doing that, I'd encourage you to tune in from home or watch it later. Keep up with the series. Behold is in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So you can be transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You say, but I'm not sure yet I'm saved. Well, for you, I end with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the promise of God to you. Will you trust in Christ today? And if you're a believer, what does he say? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing word. And we know the written word points us to the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've heard your word today. But we not only believe it in our mind, but believe it day by day and step by step. Focusing on Jesus Christ walking by faith in him, rooted in the scriptures, embracing your promises, counting you faithful who has promised, whether it's for one's salvation or one's Christian walk. And Father, if anyone is here today who's never been saved, may they realize it's not a matter of going to a church or getting baptized, catechized, or confirmed, or some experience they have or some commitment they make or some pledge or promise to you. It's not giving their life to Christ or anything like that. It's by grace through faith in the one who gave himself for us. The one who died for our sins was buried and rose again. The one who offers salvation freely and fully and forever as a gift to all who simply put their faith in him alone. And may in the quietness of their heart where they're seated, may indeed 
they make that decision that will change their destiny forever. And for us who are saved, may we learn of him. May we take his yoke. And we know that when we're yoked with him, he's the one who carries the burdens. He's the one who directs the path. He's the one who fights the battle. So we learn of him and we learn to trust him, the Lord Jesus Christ, each step of the way. And so thank you, Father, for your great plan. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, what you've done, and who you are to us, and even for your great promises. May we cast every care upon you, for you care for us. In Jesus' name.